It's the MMA parlay. MMA parlay. 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 I'm dominating bookies. 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 It's the MMA parlay. MMA parlay. King of fighting guru. Hello, patrons only. Uh, this is actually, I don't know, I'm still debating between uh, if this uh, segment will be a patron only segment or a YouTube segment as well because I feel like uh, this is a two for one in a sense. I'm going to give you my fate of the week and my lock of the week in the same fight. And that's kind of like what I do. I, my fate of the week segment goes to the YouTube channel, but my lock of the week segment goes to my patron segment uh private only so since this is the same fight i might as well consolidate so that i can save myself the time as well so let's make this i guess a uh youtube and patrons only segment guys congratulations you're getting a two for one today uh, my reason i'm giving you guys a lock of the week and a fate of the week it's not a coincidence that the guy who i am count look the marketing machine is very, very smart. I told you guys this many times that they're not transparent. They usually, when they're pushing someone, it's hard to tell what they're doing. They even sometimes make it look like they're doing the opposite and they're giving them a challenge or they're giving them a fighter who's gonna be game and bring it to them and they give them a challenging or adversity type of a matchup. But in all reality, it's quite the opposite. They're giving a guy who they've invested a lot of money in. The day that he lost to Cheeto Vera was not supposed to happen. That Cheeto Vera fight where he was a minus 400 favorite, Sean O'Malley, the Sugar Show, was supposed to put on a great performance. And look, I, I'm going to break this thing to you guys as clearly as it is, okay? Do you know, like everybody wants to argue, do you give uh, Cheeto Vera the credit did he really deserve to win? Does O'Malley have any justification to saying that he didn't lose the fight? Look, it's not as easy as just yes or no. But here's the truth of the matter. I have no bias. I have no, no reason. I like both of the fighters, to be quite frank. So there's no reason for me to be biased on anybody. But here's the facts. Here's what's true about this. If it was the first time we ever seen Marlon, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Sean O'Malley ever get injured and have that issue come up where he couldn't walk on his leg, his foot, and was giving him problems in a fight. If it was the first time it ever happened, then we got to give all props to Marlon Vera. But we've seen this happen to him more than once. This even happened in one of his fights to uh, Andre, what's his name? Hold on. Uh, one second, guys. Names is not my thing. All right, yeah, we've seen this happen in his Andre Sukamatatha, blah, 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 fight, okay? So even though he won that fight, if you notice towards the, luckily for him, it didn't happen until the third round. But this is similar to like, for example, if I tried my hardest to open a jar, the jar was very hard to open and it was uh, finally starting to move a little bit. So I got some leverage on it. I got it to move a little bit, but I didn't open it fully. And then you come and say, here, give it, give it to me. Let me open it for you. And you opened it, right? It's going to be easier for you to open it than it was for me because I gave you some help. His leg was not fully healed. It was never 100% going into that fight. So you can give him credit all you want, but had we not had an injured O'Malley go into that fight, had we not had that injury happen in the fight, I'm more than certain that he would have came out and prevailed in that fight. And there's a lot of reasons why. Look, you could say even that day that hype train was derailed, but a real fight fan, like the reason that I'm good at what I do, the reason I'm doing this for a living, the thing that got me to say, forget my $120,000 a year paying job, I think I got a future in this. You know what it was? I see fights in the fighting perspective. I can tell you what the guys are doing that the blind eye would not even know how to read if you told them. Like for example, uh, the 
Like a fighting perspective will pick up on tactics and strategies that a normal person watching a fight will never have noticed that the person was doing. And it could have been the thing that made them win or lose the fight. So here's one example. Do you know why Stipe Miocic had not lost that fight against Francis Ngano even before they spend a lot of time on their feet? They spend a lot of time. There's a reason why he had some marks on his face. It wasn't a complete wrestle match it wasn't a wrestle f type of a night you didn't you didn't screw him by just completely wrestling him the entire time shooting desperate takedowns no he used his boxing and do you know what was one of the main things that made stipe safe in the entire fight he was never in any trouble even when he was getting shots landed on him he was able to eat them better than most could and you can hear the commentators even missed it and some of those commentators are fighters themselves so this shows that not not only do i have a good fight iq it's better than your normal fighter IQ because i was a trainer because i have to dissect these things in order to help myself win and lose it's going to make the difference and these were strategies i used myself Unfortunately, I never had to use it as much as Stipe had to use it that night because I never had to fight a guy as dangerous as Stipe. Well, I did, but I was usually the more dangerous guy still. I had fights against guys who even looked like uh, Francis Ngannou, but I actually had fights against guys who were bigger than Francis Ngannou. One guy was not as muscular but skinnier, but I had to use this tactic. Now, let me tell you what Stipe does. I guarantee you, until you hear me say it, go back into this fight after I told you this. You're going to notice Stipe is not fighting Francis Ngannou. And I'm going to use this vision to help you guys break down why Sean O'Malley is a lock of the week. This is a mismatch and it's not a hype train. I don't care if he lost the fight even fair and square, even without injuries. Sean O'Malley is not a hype train. He's the actual real deal. I'm going to tell you why. He's got a switch stance that he uses better than anybody I've ever seen. When you think he's coming in orthodox and you're circling to the right side or the left, he's going to switch to his southpaw stance. When he's think when you're about to land flush on him and the entire last three and a half minutes he's been landing nothing but nor ordinary, he's going to give you a spinning forearm or spinning uh, fist to the or spinning kick. He does such good spinning act and with his precision and timing. When you incorporate somebody who does spinning kicks and spinning. Uh, the thing that like uh, Benil Darush landed on Scott Fort Holtzman and that knocked him out clean. He does that a lot. He does that spinning forearm. Th the tools, the arsenal in his shed that he uses incorporated with the timing and precision and the speed and power put together makes him world class. Nobody can ever deny that this guy is not a great fighter. Not a good fighter. A great fighter. There's no there's a reason why he was undefeated until he he only until you show me somebody outclasses him and beats him while he's not injured with one leg only a handicap fight, then I'll say maybe the hype was over exaggerated. But to be quite frank, the heat that he's been getting since that fight against uh, what's his name is the only reason we're not seeing him as a minus 700 here Almeida is the exact definition of a hype train This is a guy if you don't put him against a guy who's lost six out of his last seven Jamie Pickett If you don't put him against a guy who's lost two out of two fights a guy who's lost five out of six four out of five Look give me one guy in the UFC that Almeida's knocked out who's even won two fights in a row I don't think it's even I don't think you'll even find it so that's a hype train. A guy who, if you study the way he gets his wins, they're guys who are balling up, who don't, who do a more Jordan Wright, a Jordan uh, Wright or Malcolm Gordon type of a maneuver. They don't want no smoke. They're 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 not trying to bring the fight and the dog out. They're trying to ball up and cover up and get their paycheck and go home. Sure, Almeida will put those guys away. You're not gonna put a guy away who's trying to be the best in the world. This guy's got contention, future title uh, dreams of wanting to be a champion and the best of all time. You're not gonna put a guy away like that easily by doing one or two types of things. You gotta count and bet on the guy whose overall game, who nine out of ten times is gonna win the fight. Nine out of ten times, the skill sets, the switch stance, the timing, the precision. The accuracy, the speed, the power, these are all in his favor. The arsenal. And now you've given him some time off. He's finally, the first time in a long time, taking the time off he needed to heal himself. 
This is gonna be a fully healed 110% version of him. And the small holes, they don't even really count as holes, but the, his weakest areas in his game, I've watched him develop them. He's now a better fighter, not just a healthier fighter, a better fighter. And when you put somebody in a, their back against the wall, when they're cornered and they have to win a fight, you'll see them perform to their, that little, like the Vittori versus Hermanson. Vittori knew what was riding on that fight. It was gonna make the difference if he gets the title shot or not. He, we saw him scrum, like get back, come back from the dead. And when he had nothing left, he still kept going. That's the type of stuff that makes champions. And did you see that uh, guy uh, Phillips against Saad Young? The reason, a lot of reasons is that guy's, uh, I was high on him. I, I picked him as an underdog to win uh, because his training and his the people in his corner are very smart, good. They're a good team. They help develop the a game of a prospect very well. Same people help uh, that Philip. Uh, freaking, I forgot his name, man. Can you help me figure out that guy's name? We bet on him, uh, the Phillips against Saudi. You pull up Song Yadong and tell me his uh, last opponent's name. Okay, anyway, but let me tell you about that Stipe Miocic thing, okay? Micho, like a lot of, if you're not a fighter, you'll never recognize this. Stipe in the first fight was not fighting Francis Ngannou. Stipe was fighting the hands. He was the entire time. It's common sense, guys. What's going to be the most dangerous thing? Stipe is not fighting against the wrestler. He's not fighting against a um, submission specialist. He's not fighting against, fighting against a judo specialist. There's one thing and one thing only he's got to look out for. The fire. The fireman knows what the fire is. It's that punch. He's got to look out for that one punch. And if you're going to only give somebody's path to victory as one punch and everything else in the favor of the other guy, how can you not make that guy the most favorite, a uh, big favorite? But let me tell you what Stipe was doing. Stipe was fighting the hands. Every time they were fighting, and this worked perfectly, you'll notice his hands were close to Stipe's hands. He had the stance. When you're fighting against a guy who doesn't wrestle, See, MMA is different than boxing. I've told you guys this a million times. If you're in an MMA fight and you're fighting against a guy who's similar to like a Paul Craig or a, a guy who likes, or even a guy like uh, Cody, Kobe Covington, they shoot for takedowns and they mix it up with their strikes. So the best way to do it is to keep a low or medium guard. Unlike boxing where they keep, they tell you to keep your hands up all the time. If you do that in MMA, you're gonna lose fights. You gotta have a specific special stance that requires your guard to be lower than boxers usually keep them. But Stipe knows that this is not a guy who you have to use, that doesn't apply to fighting against. He had the most perfect, he did everything perfect. And he has a great team that teaches him these things, but he was a Golden Gloves boxer. You don't have to teach him these things. This is the most, there's a reason why his performance at the Knight Award, he broke and shattered records against guys who are one punch knockout artists like Mark Hunt. For example, he did this to him as well. You, you'll notice that he keeps his hands close to uh, Francis Ngannou's hands. So every time, Francis is thinking about throwing a punch, and you guys have seen it, even in his most recent fight. Unless we see a version of Francis Ngannou who's never gonna be the, who has never fought this way before. But if we see 100% of the tapes that I've ever watched, 100% of the fights that we've ever seen on Francis Ngannou, the way he knocks people out, and the way he uses his power punch is by throwing a crazy loops, loopy, uh, wide, wide angled punch. And what's more better than having that stance when somebody, all you gotta do is push it, push it. If you just, if you deflect it by us, it's like almost like when somebody is bench pressing and you're spotting them and you just tap a little bit of, you just put a couple of fingers underneath the dumbbell and it helps them tremendously. It's the same thing guys. When somebody's throwing with 200 pounds of velocity and weight, tap that shit. You just tap it. Look what's going to make the biggest difference. It's going to go from landing flush, landing like 100% uh, efficiency and effectiveness to like 30%, 20%. So he'll still eat these punches. They will not be nearly as dangerous, effective, or hard because he's deflecting it. He's, he's, even if he's not deflecting it because 
Francis understands that he's continuously doing this to him. Now he's throwing it even wider. Now he's throwing it from an even more uncomfortable, unnatural, uncor incorrect manner. The more incorrect you're throwing it, the more unnatural it is, the more, even when he shoots for his takedowns, you know, they're not just regular takedowns. He's timing and understanding that steep, that Francis is, when he's throwing his upper, he tried that uppercut thing a couple of times, you'll notice. He had an answer for it though. Stipe knew it was coming. And what did he do? He started to realize, similar to the thing that Peter Yan does a lot. He times things after he learns, after repetition. He sees that you're doing it over and over. So when he shoots in for the, unlike Curtis Blades, who didn't realize this in the Derek Lewis fight, which Derek Lewis holds a win. Uh, guys, do you remember what type of a fade Lewis looked like before the landing that one punch knockout? Lewis got outlanded 40 to zero. It was a 10-8 round against Curtis Blades before he knocked him out. He was on his way to losing like a 50 to 45 to 30 to five. It was like a, it was the most lopsided mismatch, biggest shame of a fight I've ever seen. It was the most embarrassing poor performance of a fighter I've ever seen. He stood there doing nothing until he landed the punch. So that guy is the same guy that beat Francis Ngano. You're telling me a guy that's on that low level is going to be able to beat Francis, but Stipe, who's the best of all time at this, isn't going to? Look how he fights the hands, guys. Every time he deflects, and not only is he now deflecting the punch, he's going to be able to land his own. Those little tip-tap uh, sharp, ask a... Ask a Ask a Usman what type of a success he had throwing those little smart, sharp, uh, uh, stinging jabs against Gilbert Burns. How much success did he have? He became a champion, like his own tra trainer and coach Trevor Whitman said. He's won. He's a champion because of his jabs. They will steep it now. Not only is he being offensive, but defensive at the same time by using these things. But a normal person wouldn't pick up on it. They're gonna think he's just trying to block, or he's he doesn't. They don't understand that this is what's keeping him able to stay on the feet for as long as he wants and still not get knocked out. Unless Stipe, I mean, I'm sorry, unless Ngano becomes a crisp precise, accurate, striking boxer, and even then, he's not gonna be able to then rely on that crazy knockout power. He's gonna have to win by scorecards, or he's gonna have to win by an accumulation of strikes, not one punch. So anybody who's got the access to one and a half rounds, which if I'm not mistaken, it's pretty much the entire world is being given one and a half round prop bet. If you don't like Stipe, at least give him the credit. This guy's known to be the best of all time. Give him the credit, he'll last more than one and a half. Instead of betting against him, I strongly advise you, if you're on the hype train of Francis, bet the over one and a half instead, you guys. Don't be greedy. Anyway, back to the lock of the week and the fate of the week. Almeida is a bust, guys. I hate to break it to all the Almeida fans. Look what John Martinez did, who just came off of a loss, a, a bad loss to, uh, who was it, Dewey Grant, whatever his name is. He, and he outclassed him. You know why? Imagine if Woodley was not a former champion. This is Almeida and Woodley are the same, taking out the has been, a shell of himself. This guy is not a shell of himself. He's just never been anything that. It was just a deceiving thing. He looked great on the regional scenes, he looked great against lower level fighters. The second you gave him a step up in competition, even if it wasn't the best step up of competition, he blew it. He got annihilated. He got put away. He didn't even make it to the scorecards. The only time he made it to the scorecards was against Martinez, and that was at his best. He was looking as good as we've ever seen him, and he had come off of a long layoff where he was fully rested. He's not going to be fully... He even... Look at what... Uh, Sean O'Malley said in the interviews, in more than one interview, he said that this fight was supposed to have happened already, but they had to give Almeida more time because he said he wasn't ready. He needed more time to prepare for Sean O'Malley. What did I tell you about interviews? How important are they? Didn't I tell you when JP Pies told us that he wasn't going to study any more fight tapes after seeing Bruno Silva's last fight against Tagir? He felt very nervous and he was going to feel like a... a, a he was going to be very, he was going to, uh, he said some words that stood out, stood out to me. Something like, I'm not going to freak myself out by watching more fight tapes because i already seen how good he is. That says it all, guys. 
the guy's already lost the fight before it even started. That's huge. If you don't have a confidence in yourself going into a fight, you pretty much already lost the fight. Look what happened with the Connor and the Dustin Poirier fight. He wanted to be buddy-buddy. He didn't have that dog inside of him that we've seen in the first fight where he was talking smack and trying to call him peanut head and just being disrespectful because he was confident. This time he was being nice and shaking hands and talking about being business partners and buddy-buddy. That's intimidation, guys. He was intimidated by Dustin. He knew that Dustin had had the better resume. Recently, he was coming off of impressive wins and bad wide. This guy was doing whiskey commercials and beating up people at the bar. And it was just a world of difference between who's been doing way better. So he knew that, this, and he even said it at the end of the fight that look, inactivity was my worst thing. He's like, I haven't been active and not being active is what cost me this fight. So he knew going into the fight because that was his first excuse right after the fight, that I lost because of this. So this was something he already thought about that was going to be working against him. So he went into the fight not confident. And look what happened to him. Sean O'Malley is a lock of the week if I've ever seen one. And I know he's a little bit expensive for people's taste. But if you consider that if it wasn't for that loss, if he was still undefeated, if it wasn't for that injury, a guy coming off of three fights in a row losing three fights in a row and he wasn't a former champion like a woodley or nothing what reasons do we not have to put this guy's at minus 700 his timing is not better his speed and accuracy and power and reach is not better all of those things are important things i just listed five are in the favor of sean o'malley so forget about who's done what and how they've looked numbers and stats don't lie this guy's absorption rate versus striking rate. Um, and what was the first thing that I asked you to show to give me? The Phillips fight. What was his name? Kyler Phillips. Kyler Phillips. They train similar people are they they Phillips and uh, Sean O'Malley have people that are the same people on their corner that they work with to develop their game. So you see how impressive he looked. It's not a coincidence that they looked uh, similar. Uh, Adrian Yanez is a guy who I like to compare as well. So this guy fights a lot like Adrian Yanez. Adrian Yanez is very calm and cool and collective, and he sees the openings. He doesn't force them. That's another thing I like about Sean. Sean O'Malley is not desperate for the openings. He see, he waits for the correct opportunity. So he'll go from not doing anything to the next thing he does, finishes the fight. Look at what he did to uh, Eddie Wineland. It took a total of... 13 strikes. 13 strikes only to finish the fight. But he only got landed against four times. Look at his uh, Jose Quinones fight. Show me a fight with Almeida where the numbers say this. 18 significant strikes in the first round. Performance of the night. He finished Jose Quinones. In the, not even Luis Smoka was able to do that. To, he lost the first round to Jose Quinones. Not only did Sean O'Malley not lose the first round, he finished him inside it. But guess what the numbers were? 18 to 0. So a healthy guy, not injured who's patient. He didn't land like 60 strikes, but there are 18 significant, very precise and accurate and devastating strikes where the 17th one, after the 17th one, it only took one more to finish the fight. That's He's the master. He's the Mark Hunt of his division. This guy does the most walk-off TKOs. You know, and there's a there's this thing. Every time you see a guy who does walk-off TKOs, that's confidence, guys. This guy knows he did enough to put in that. When I tell you about confidence a minute ago, confidence gets wins. You need it to win fights. So he's got a, sh a ton load, a, a, a ton of it. And that's another advantage that you can't ignore. His body kicks, he throws a great kick to the side. There's a reason why he gets injured in his fights a lot. He throws with everything he's got. So it's actually a good thing in a sense. He needs to tone it back a little bit, but the way he, f he flings his kicks, the way he throws his kicks is with everything he's got. He doesn't leave anything to, to not throw into it. He throws with 110% of his might and his body. He doesn't pull any back. So this is the type of a guy who can take you out even with a kick. But that's the reason he got injured is over more than a couple of times because he throws with everything he's got. He doesn't hold back. Um, another thing is that he's confusing his opponents. You cannot go in... 
Unless you're going to wing it, you cannot devise a game plan against Sean O'Malley. If you have a game plan, you might as well throw it out the window before the fight starts because you can't predict a guy like this. He's got switch stance and he uses it often. You can never say that this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to stick to the game plan. you got to be a guy who's got good IQ and knows how to wing it, who knows how to go and on the fly make decisions and audibles. And if you can't make good audible plays against a guy like this guy, you're going to go to sleep. He's going to put you to sleep. So even if he doesn't put this guy in, we've seen that this guy is very chinny. He loses a lot of his fights by getting slept. He doesn't have the most durable chin. So a guy like that and a guy like this is the per- So a lot of people are even betting against him. I've seen people saying that Almeida is the dog of the week and that he's being disrespected. The lines are crazy. Yeah, they're, they're crazy, all right, but for the wrong reasons. They should be higher. So there's actually value here, guys. Take my word on it. What do I know, right? All right, so guys, uh, let's uh, wrap this up. I got to make some private segments. If you're in the Patreon, you're going to get the main card. First, next segment is going to be the main card breakdowns. And then the next segment will be the post weigh in observations. And then the final segment will be the full card predictions and picks for tonight. And then I'm also going to break down, I'm also going to submit and release my full prop bets, parlays, and single bets, and my bet slips with the instructions on how to bet tonight's or tomorrow's fights. So you can just duplicate my system, my picks, my bets. And you'll know how to allocate your money. So if you have $1,000, you'll know how much to put on every single bet. It'll be done for you. You don't got to do no research. You don't got to do no thinking. There's no room and error for mis- There's no room for mistakes. You leave it to me. This is my job and there ain't nobody better at it. If there's anything I'm better at than knowing how to pick fights and dissect fights is betting. I'm the master at it. You seen yesterday, I wasn't picky for the first time. I I did a smaller uh, outside MMA breakdown and stuff, but you saw, I gave you parlays and single bets. Another day, we went four days in a row with 100% accuracy in outside MMA. Not one bet didn't cash in, and they were paying great. We had a parlay paying four to one. $40 won, like over 150 bucks almost. So go ahead, and guys, hop in on Outside MMA. I even do freebies for $10 patrons. They got a freebie Outside MMA pick yesterday. It was the Trailblazers to beat the Miami Heat because I did my research. I knew that there was three questionable players. Jimmy Butler had a stomach flu. So, guys, I do my research and due diligence for every sport. If there's an opening in NHL, look at, go back in my NHL record. It's there. I've got over 90% accuracy in NHL, over 95% actually in NHL picks. Four days in a row in my NBA, I've been 100% accurate. And I don't just give two or three plays usually. I give about five or six. Two day, two, the, the day before yesterday's, the last time I went uh, 4-0 or 5-0 in NBAs. All of my bet, bets cashed in for NHL as well on the same day. So anybody who puts the NHL and NBA together had an 8-1 to paying parlay. You can go see it. It's on the screenshots. Or look at my Twitter account. I get... I give testimonials and screenshots of all the people who are thanking me. Look at my YouTube section. I even have people from my Patreon go to my YouTube section and thank me for their parlays cashing in for the NBA. We had two games that were comeback games, Washington Wizards versus the uh, Kings. We had another parlay piece there cashed in for us. Lots of money to be made, guys. You don't have, after a while, you'll notice if you, once you start to trust my picks and my research, you don't have to even work. This is going to generate more money than any job, unless you're a doctor or a lawyer. And even then, I can argue. I have guys, I don't want to put their names out there, but after the fights, I'll show you. In one night, made over $20,000. I myself showed you I made $16,000 in one event. And I only bet $3,000. But there's guys that bet $20,000 in an event. You know what these guys are doing? They make one year salary in one event. You don't have to be like that guy, but eventually, if you're listening to my betting tips, because I got a betting tips folder, I tell you how to stack up without risking your money. And there's a, a there's an actual equation. Every week, you gotta listen to my steps. If you listen to my steps, even if you have two or three or four bad weeks, 
uh, in a row, you're still going to be up more than down. You're never losing your money because this is a war, not a battle. All right, please hit the like, hit the subscribe, hit the reminder bells so I can keep coming back with more content for you guys, okay? All right, thank you guys for joining my channel. Again, we're almost at 1,000. I'm also going to do a live companion. If you guys want to get some live betting opportunities and moments to capitalize on so I can tell you when I'm seeing a fighter do the right things or not, to hammer them down. And get good plus money sometimes like that, guys. All right, don't forget to leave a comment as well. I need comments. To, the algorithm for the channel will be pushed. That's important for you. So if you appreciate what I'm doing for you guys, leave a comment, please, more than anything else. Thank you, guys. See you in the next video.